good evening. Okay, uh, good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, we have an international audience of people from around the world joining us today. And I would like to thank each and every single one of you for attending. My name is Julie Smith and I am on the local executive board of the Science and Culture Network of Southern California. I will be moderating today's event with renowned German paleontologist, Dr. Gunter Beckley. He will reveal some stunning new findings about the fossil record, which may forever change the way you see and understand the emergence of life on earth. It's just some really, really incredible information. And I've had a, a sneak preview and I can tell you I was blown away because it, it was different than what I have been taught all, all my life. And uh, so in, in any case, before we go to Dr. Ben Beckley's presentation, I would like to introduce you to the president of the Science and Culture Network of Southern California, Dr. Jim Johansson. And he's going to say a few words about our chapter and the Colorado chapter and our respective missions. Here's Jim. Hello, everyone. We're really glad that you could join us. Um, let me just do a little bit of an introduction. Um, so for the Southern California chapter of the Discovery Institute Science and Culture Network, we welcome you to this event. As Julie so nicely stated, my name is Jim Johansson, the, the, the chapter president. The mission of all of our chapters is to advance the understanding that human beings and nature are the result of an intelligent design rather than blind and undirected process. And we do this for our California chapter um, here in um, Southern California. We are a chapter of the Discovery Institute's um, Center for Science and Culture. We're glad to be working with uh, the Colorado chapter as well. We are grateful for the Discovery Institute's sustained effort as a thought leader in intelligent design and for their support in our chapter. We would like you to join in our mission of engaging our community and culture with the power of the ideas that we are engaging with. And we have venues where we highlight Discovery Institute speakers, like we're having the wonderful experience today, as well as those individuals who are active in, in research and intelligent design. Please remember this event is free. And if you like what you hear, please feel free to make a donation to our chapter. We invite you to get on our emailing list. Um, feel free to opt in via our website or email us directly so we can include you in information sharing. We are planning a number of events both online and as we are able to have things face-to-face um, -face, and for us, that would be in the Southern California area. We wanna pass the word on to you and to your colleagues, help us get the word out. Plus you can make a financial contribution to our chapter on our website and I'll show that in just a minute or directly through the main Discovery Institute website. And so let me just um, introduce the wonderful team that I have the pleasure of working with. Um, First, uh, Walter Meyer is a vice president. Um, we're very fortunate to have him on our, our staff. Um, Julie Smith, who you just got a chance to hear, is doing a great job of helping us to get the, the message out as our secretary. Daniel Kerr is our treasurer. Joel Vaughn is our outreach um, coordinator and plus my, myself. So let me just go ahead and share um, a couple of screen captures that show our website and um, remind you of the link. And I'll also put this in the, the chat if you, um, to, if you don't, so you don't have to write it down. So, but it's socal.scienceandculturenetwork is our, our website and it would take you to this. You'll see a thematic por, uh, way of representing our Southern California environment here and the things that you can be, be doing with, with um, on the website is, um, you can be either doing a, a donation. If you just click on the donate, you can donate to our chapter. This is the, the general email you can use to contact SCNSoCal, SoCal at SCNSoCal.org. And you can also subscribe to um, our email list and we'll be sure to keep you in the loop for, for updates. Well, thank you very much. I'm gonna pass this back over to Julie. <clears throat> thank you, Jim. After Gunter's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. So if you would like to submit questions, uh, please put them in the chat and we will be monitoring them during Gunter's presentation. Then after the presentation, I'll provide some more links and resources about how you can become involved in the intelligent design movement. 
And we know that there are people around the world. And if you discovered this event through the Eventbrite platform, you may be unfamiliar with the Discovery Institute. So before we start Gunter's presentation, we wanted to show you a short video from the Discovery Institute in Seattle about the, this revolution of intelligent design in the sciences. Let's go ahead and watch. As a scientist, scientist, microbiologist, biochemist, biochemist, as a geologist, neuroscientist, physician, biologist, and an engineer, I think there is overwhelming evidence for intelligent design in nature. I see intelligent design in the history of life, in the genetic code of life, in the molecular machines inside our cells, in the complexity of life, in the information embedded in living things, in the operation of the human brain, in the features of the human body, in the chicken and egg causal circularity of life. As a mathematician, I see great evidence of purpose in the universe. As a molecular biologist, I see evidence for design everywhere I look, pretty much. Nature is incomprehensible without inference to purpose and to intelligent design. properties of the universe as a whole, and our planet in particular, were fine-tuned for our benefit and for our survival. In my view, the fossil evidence clearly points to its intelligent design. I see life as designed because when I look at life at the molecular level, I see exquisite engineering. All cells contain DNA, which include lots of information. And information is only the product of a mind. Darwin thought living cells were just blobs of jelly. But when I look in a living cell, I see evidence of factories, machines, uh, three-dimensional architectures, enormous amounts of encoded information. There's power generators, there's manufacturing plants. Life contains many features that we know from experience only arise from the activity of intelligent agents. The genetic code is like a software program. It's like somebody would have had to be a coder, would have had to form this particular genetic code. When I see that, order and design, I have a really hard time believing that random mutation and natural selection, selection alone can cause uh, the complexity and the diversity you see in life. When you look at nature at large, what you see is incredible examples of innovation which surpass human technology. Examples include the flight capabilities of a hummingbird, sonar and bats, and greater innovation always implies greater intelligence from a designer. If you read the message from the molecules, it's really clear. They say clearly, intelligent design, intelligent design, intelligent design is the source of life. Well, thank you so much for watching. Are you ready for Dr. Beckley? Before he speaks, I would like to introduce him. Dr. Beckley is a paleoentomologist, which means his research focuses on the fossil history of insects. And I'm gonna guess that uh, Dr. Beckley, you were one of those kids that brought live insects into your bedroom and you had them there and uh, you like kind of kept them as pets, is that correct? That's actually actually right. Yeah, I had a lot of them in glasses in my room, and my mother was not amused. <laughs> well, what, what can we say? Kids will be kids, right? <laughs> so right. in any case, uh, Dr. Beckley is a senior fellow with the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. He is a senior research scientist at the Biologic Institute in Redmond, Washington in the United States. And he is also the chairman for the Center of Biocomplexity and Natural Teleology in Austria. Dr. Beckley is one of the world's leading experts on fossil dragonflies. And he investigates discontinuities in the history of life and the waiting time problem in evolution. He earned his master's of science degree in biology and his PhD in geosciences from the Eberhard Karls University of Tübingen in Germany. From 1999 to 2016, he worked as the scientific curator at the State Museum of Natural History in Stuttgart, Germany. 
as a successor to one of the most famous modern German scientists, Professor Willy Hennig, who was the founder of cladistics. And if you're unfamiliar with the word cladistics, it means it's a modern method of classification of plants and animals. Gunther has also taught at the Hohenheim University in Germany, and he has authored or co-authored 160 scientific publications, including a book published by Cambridge University Press. He has discovered and named more than 180 new species, and he has 11 biological groups named in his honor. He has served on the editorial boards of five scientific journals and has organized large public exhibitions on earth history and evolution, including the largest event for the celebration of Darwin year in 2009 in Germany. Dr. Beckley's research has received broad national and international media coverage at the BBC, Scientific American Magazine, and National Geographic. And he is known for the discovery of an entirely new insect order called Coxoplectoptera. He has been interviewed widely in German TV, radio and press, and has served as a science advisor for several natural history documentaries by the BBC, some with David Attenborough. He lives with his wife and two sons in Austria. And Dr. Beckley, I understand that when you made this Darwin year display, you made some interesting personal discoveries which changed everything for you. And I'm just wondering if you would be so kind as to tell us about this. And here's Dr. Dr. Beckley. Yeah, definitely. I will give you some of the backstory how I came to intelligent design in a moment. So let's start. Uh, my talk and my presentation. I also say hello uh, to everybody and thanks for joining. So I will activate screen sharing so we will see some nice slides. This will work. So I hope uh, you can see the first slide. Maybe Julie can give me a sign if this is uh, working yes. correctly. It looks, it looks great, Gunther. Looks absolutely okay, great. Okay, perfect. So the topic of our today's webinar is evidence against neo-Darwinism from the fossil record. So alone this title may surprise some people because most people think that the fossil record is the prime evidence in favor of Darwin's theory. So we will look uh, if this is really true or is maybe the other way around. But first, some words about uh, this background story of mine. And when I was still working at the Natural History Museum in Stuttgart, I was responsible to organize the largest event in Germany for the Darwin year 2009. That was the 200th birthday of Charles Darwin and the 105th uh, anniversary of the first publication of his original species. And we organized this large exhibition. And of course, we also wanted to uh, discuss this subject of modern critics of Darwin, creationism, intelligent design. And actually, I was opposed to it. I wanted to mock the whole thing. And therefore, I designed uh, this exhibit, uh, which you can see in this uh, larger screenshot. Uh, this medieval wooden balance with books on the one side, a large pile of books from the intelligent design movement. And on the other side, uh, just two books by Charles Darwin, but the balance goes down on Darwin's side to show, well, Darwin has the strong arguments and the heavy weighted arguments and all the rest is basically light weighted nonsense. So because of this exhibition, I had to buy these books and I, uh, at Amazon and I had them stored in my office prior to the opening of the exhibition. And someday I thought, well, maybe I should have a look into these books uh, in case that people will have questions during the exhibition. And then I looked into these books and I was quite surprised uh, to find that the arguments were much more sophisticated than I had expected, that they were not religion-based, but science-based and not easy to address or even to refute. And so I studied the whole stuff more and the more I studied uh, uh, these uh, problems, the more I recognized that there are indeed valid concerns and that uh, these critics are justified. And I more and more became a Darwin critic and an ID proponent myself, which ultimately, and this took many years actually from 2009 till uh, end of 2015 when I went public as an ID proponent and this led a year later to uh, losing my job at the Natural History Museum, but that is a different 
story. So that is a little bit my background, how I came to embrace uh, intelligent design. So it was not based on religion. It was exclusively based on rational arguments and scientific evidence. And of course, there's also evidence from my own field, from the field of fossil record of paleontology. So let's have a look. It doesn't change the slides if I press this button. Okay, let's try it this way. So first we should know that every theory makes certain predictions. And one of the core predictions of Darwin's theory is so-called gradualism. This means that changes come about by small steps one after the other. And that's the reason why Darwin used in his uh, work, uh, the original species, a Latin sentence six times. And this sentence is natura non facet saltus. Nature doesn't make jumps because he was quite aware if there are jumps, if there are saltations in nature, then this cannot be explained naturalistically. Uh, this requires something like miraculous interventions. And he wanted a naturalistic theory. And this is not just one minor issue for Darwin's theory, it's a core issue. And if this is wrong, then the whole theory is in problems. And you can see this from one of his most popular modern proponents, Richard Dawkins wrote 2009, evolution not only is a gradual process, as a matter of fact, it has to be gradual if it is to do any explanatory work. But of course, Darwin himself was already aware that the fossil record doesn't look gradual, but he still hoped that it's based on gaps of knowledge, that it's the incompleteness of the fossil record and our insufficient knowledge of the fossil record. And he hoped this will improve over time. So are these only gaps of evidence or is this really evidence for discontinuities in nature? And a famous paleontologist, Philip Gingrich, once said gaps of evidence are gaps of evidence and not evidence of gaps. But is this really true? Actually, we can relatively easily find out and my colleague Paul Nelson made a wonderful analogy. And he said, imagine that you have a new hobby and it's beach combing and you walk along the beach and you collect what the flood washes in. And every day you find something new, new shellfish, new mussels, new uh, starfish. And, uh, but the longer you do this hobby, the more repetition sets in and you find after a while, all the same stuff all over again. And when you have reached a point where you don't find new stuff easily anymore, but only re find repetition of stuff you have already discovered before, then you have know that you have reached a kind of point of saturation where what you didn't find is not just undersampling, lack of evidence, uh, it's really evidence that something is not out there. And this very method is actually used in paleontology and it's called the collector curve. And it's used to make a statistical test on the completeness of the fossil record. So to test is Darwin's uh, uh, explaining a way of, of these discontinuities still valid. And in this collector's curve, you have a horizontal axis, which is the effort you have to invest to find something new. You can measure this in time uh, for digging fossils or in grant money, uh, man hours, whatever you want. And in the vertical axis uh, are the new fossil forms that you discover. And you see this curve is in the beginning very steep. This means you don't have to invest a lot of time and money to find something really new. You dig a little bit here, dig a little bit there, and you have found interesting new stuff. But over time, this curve flattens and then repetition set, sets in and you need to invest a lot of time, a lot of money to find something new at all. And these kind of tests have been applied to all different groups of fossils. And we meanwhile know that the fossil record is on the level of the major transitions on the macroevolutionary level very complete. For example, 80% of modern families of land vertebrates have already been found in the, the fossil record. So of course, it's not totally complete on the species level because not every species get fossilized. Probably it's just one of 100 or one of 1000 species that get fossilized. But what we should find these intermediate forms, these intermediate body plans, they are certainly very, very well and complete represented in the fossil record. 
So we can no longer say it's the incompleteness of the fossil record uh, to explain away the discontinuities that we find out there. So, and the final uh, information before we look into the uh, actual cases of discontinuities in the fossil record is the question, when I say that a certain group appeared in the fossil record in a short window of time of let's say 5 million years, that sounds like a lot of time in terms of human history, for example. But in terms of biology, this is still very abrupt and uh, this can be shown quite easily with this measure of species longevity that would be the lifespan of the species, not of an individual animal, but how long does a species exist for, from its origin till its extinction or its dissolution into a daughter species. And there are in the textbook standard measures for these lifespans or longevities of animal species. And these are depending on the group between two and a half and 10 million years. So 5 million years is just the lifespan of one or two successive species. And it's of course impossible with Darwinian means to achieve a major reconstruction, a major re-engineering of the body plan with just so few intermediate species having at your disposal. So if we look at the fossil record and we look at earth history, when can we first find life at all. There is an event early in Earth history about uh, 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. It's called the late heavy bombardment. That is a time where the largest, pass, uh, uh, largest part of the meteorite mass uh, impacted on Earth. And there was a paper in 2014 in Nature which found that uh, in this time, several times the oceans have been repeatedly completely evaporated. So life in the oceans and therefore life at all was impossible during or before this time of the late heavy bombardment, which lasted until 3.8 billion years ago. So how long did it take for chemical evolution to create life afterwards? Well, actually we find life immediately at 3.8 billion years ago. All the older ages that you find in the uh, literature are very controversial and probably wrong and um, sometimes do not even uh, represent real fossils, but so-called pseudo fossils. But the really uh, well accepted evidence is 3.8 billion years ago. So life is there from the very beginning and not after let's say a half billion year of uh, chemical evolution. That is actually quite surprising. But what is even more surprising is that we find that with the earliest life, we find already one of the most complex and most sophisticated mechanisms in nature, and that is photosynthesis. And you see here in the images just some, some illustrations of the complexity of the involved proteins and the interactions. And this is there already also uh, 3.8 billion years ago. So after, uh, from Darwinian theory, we should expect to find uh, something like this after hundreds of millions of years of evolution, small steps building up and then creating these molecular machines and these complex proteins and not with the very beginning with the very first life forms right after the first possibility on earth to, for life to exist at all. And the next point in Earth history is the first so-called explosion. And this is prior to the Cambrian explosion that, that you maybe have already heard of. And that is the so-called Avalon explosion. It happened about 570 million years ago in the so-called age of the Idiakaran prior to the Cambrian. And Avalon is the name of an ancient continent that was reconstructed but doesn't exist anymore. And there you find the first really recognizable macro fossils that even a layman would recognize as fossil organisms, but they look very strange, very alien. They have a different symmetry from modern organisms, the so-called light symmetry. They have a fractal growth pattern. They have a kilted structure like an air mattress, no visible organs. So nobody knows what they really are. And there have been all kinds of different hypotheses if they are fungi or pro giant protists or animals or plants or uh, algae 
or an independent way to multicellular life. Nobody knows really for sure, but they appear suddenly without precursors in the fossil record before. before. Then they exist for a certain time and then they go extinct. And they are certainly from their body plan, not the precursors of the Cambrian animal phyla. And that would be the next event in Earth history. And this event has been called in, in a Time Magazine article, Evolution's Big Bang, the Cambrian explosion. And of course, words like Big Bang and explosion indicate that we are not dealing with gradual events. So in the Cambrian, about 520 million years ago, what we find is a sudden appearance without any precursors in the fossil record before of the so-called animal phyla, especially the bilaterian animal phyla. That would be the major body plants like uh, chordates, vertebrates, arthropods, echinoderms, mollusks, and so on. And we find all these different animals, 20 of the 33 known metazoan phyla or body plants we find suddenly appearing in the Cambrian, not stepwise built up, but th with their whole diversity already from the very beginning. And of course, this was a quite inconvenient finding. And so paleontologists and evolutionists tried to explain it away. And the most popular uh, explanation was the so-called artifact hypothesis. People said, well, we find these fossils, animals, which were probably small and soft bodied only in suitable layers. And they existed only in the Cambrian, for example, in this famous Burgess Shale. But similar layers simply didn't exist in the Ediacara. This has been refuted by the discovery of about a dozen of so-called Burgess Shale type localities from the Ediacaran age, which have exactly the same geological structure like the famous Burgess Shale from the Cambrian. But what you find in these layers is just algae. And it is meanwhile acknowledged by mainstream evolutionists that animals are lacking in these layers, not because they haven't been found, but because they didn't exist at this time. So the artifact hypothesis is actually debunked. Another kind of critique of the Cambrian explosion was based on the so-called small shelly fauna. Now the small shelly fauna is uh, a fauna of small fragments of animals, of shells, spines, uh, sh parts of exoskeletons, of echinoderms and arthropods that we find at the base of the Cambrian. And then people said, well, but in the Ediacaran, there's also something like that. It's called the Ediacaran shelly fauna. And therefore, there is some kind of continuity. And this is showing the precursors of the Cambrian explosion. But if we look at the actual two shelly faunas, we find that they are totally different. And the Ediacaran shelly fauna is made up of just three different organisms and mainly of two, Cludina and Namacalatus. And what these animals or whatever they are show is when we have a lot of fossils of them is that they have a branching growth, which is totally uh, untypical for bilaterian animals if you have this kind of branching and budding. So uh, there is no continuity between the Ediacaran shelly fauna and the Cambrian shelly fauna. They're totally different, very distinct, and there's no continuity connecting these both things. And finally, there was another argument, and this was actually a quite good argument until recently, and it was based on so-called trace fossils. So sometimes there are fossils that are not based on body fossils, but just on the traces that animals leave on the seafloor when they are walking or crawling or digging in the sediment. And what you see on the uh, left side of this color uh, image table is different trace fossils from the Ediacaran. Some of them look like there was a worm crawling there and others look like there was an arthropod walking. And uh, this was quite convincing and people thought, well, this is certain evidence for the presence of animals in the Ediacaran, even if we haven't found the, the, their bodies. And then came a groundbreaking study by Mariotti et al. in 2016. And what they did is they said, well, typical for the Ediacaran were bacterial mats, microbial mats that were sealing the seafloor. And let's grow such microbial mats in an aquarium tank and look what happens when these mats are stirred up and settle. 
And what you see on the right side of, these, uh, of this color table are just artifacts of shrinking and folding of these bacterial and microbial mats that have been produced in the experiment in the aquarium tank. None of these traces is produced by an animal crawling uh, across the seafloor. And you see they are one-to-one -one identical with the uh, traces that we have found in the Ediacaran. So we can no longer say there is a continuity of trace fossils from the Ediacaran to the Cambrian and only in the Cambrian we find a real trace fossil record with digging animals, therefore it's also called the Cambrian substrate revolution. And to show you that you really have to be careful with the popular press announcement of alleged findings in science is there was not long ago in 2018 a discovery and it was announced in the popular press that now it has been shown the Cambrian explosion was a slow event and it took at least 40 million years, much slower than previously thought. And when I looked at the actual paper, it actually shows the total opposite. It made the Cambrian explosion more acute. So what did the people do? They looked at the fossil record of arthropods. And they first looked, where do we find the oldest representative of potential ancestors of arthropods? And they found them 518 million years ago. And then they looked, where do we find the first real arthropods, like trilobites? And they found them 521 million years ago. So the younger, more modern fossils, uh, 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 or uh, the more modern fossils that should be younger turned out to be three million years older. So they had to postulate a kind of ghost lineage to explain this uh, temporal paradox. And then they said, maybe we can solve this whole thing. Let's look at the trace fossil record. And they found trace fossils 537 million years ago. And these trace fossils could be identified and they are actually the most famous trace fossils that you learn in your first years at studying paleontology, the so-called Rusophycus traces, which are resting traces of trilobites. So suddenly the trilobites, which are already modern arthropods with an exoskeleton, with articulated legs, with compound eyes, turned out to have been shown to have existed 537 million years ago, much older than the oldest evidence for their alleged ancestors. And what these authors also acknowledged is when they looked at these different localities that have been found, uh, Burgess shale type localities from the Ediacaran, these authors acknowledged that 550 million years ago, there were no enemies. So what the study actually showed is that from no animals and even no stem animals 550 million years ago, we went to completely modern arthropods with compound eyes, exoskeleton, articulated legs in just 13 million years. That is just one or two successive marine invertebrate species. Totally impossible to get from, let's say, a protist-like or at best jellyfish-like ancestor in the Ediacaran to a um, trilobite-like arthropod with just one or two intermediate species. So it shows the study showed the opposite from the popular claim. So you always have to look really at the evidence, never believe some headlines in the press. So and if we make a short walk through the whole Earth history, we find that this Cambrian explosion, which is probably the most well-known event of these discontinuities in the fossil record, but this is not an exception from the rule, but shows just a general pattern. The next event would be in the Ordovician, and there is something that has been called in the New Scientist journal, Life's second Big Bang. It's the great Ordovician biodiversification event, or Gobe, and there you had a sudden explosion of diversity of the marine invertebrates from just a few families to, to 500 different families of marine invertebrates, a burst in diversity. And without continuity in the fossil record where we show how this did build up uh, over time with small changes. And what this also shows, if we look at this pattern, what we should expect based on Darwin's theory is that we first find a species, an ancestral species, and then 
it uh, uh, splits into daughter species and these daughter species split into daughter species and they get gradually a little bit similar and then sometimes they uh, reach the point where they are different genera and after a longer time they reach the level of different families and after a long long time we have different orders and different phyla different body plants but what we find instead of this bottom-up pattern is a top-down pattern. We find this diversity of different animal body plants right at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. And just later, for example, at this great Ordovician biodiversification event, we find this playing on these motifs, on these the diversification of these body plants. So the opposite from, from Darwinian expectation, this is an empirical contradiction of the theory. And it goes on and on if we walk through Earth history and we now go with each step a little bit further towards, towards recent times. So at the Silurian and Devonian, that is still a time about 420 million years ago, there's something that has been called the terrestrial revolution. It's the appearance of land plants which made life on land uh, possible at all. And uh, here's a quote from a paper, uh, Bateman et al. And they said, uh, this uh, terrestrial revolution in the Silurian Devonian is the terrestrial equivalent of the much debated Cambrian explosion. So the same pattern, again, no continuity, but abrupt appearance. In the Devonian itself, about 400 million years ago, we have an event that has been named by a, a former study friend of mine, uh, Christian Klug. It's the Devonian Necton Revolution. It's the total turnover of the composition of marine communities. There are basically three modes of life in the sea. You can live close to the seafloor, that is called, called demersial. Then you can uh, live drifting passively in the water column, that is called plankton. Or you can be an active swimmer, like fish or cephalopods, that is called necton. And what you see in this chart is that uh, around 400 million years ago, you have a totally change before uh, there was only very few of this blue necton. That is the percentage of the biodiver marine biodiversity. And after this sudden event, most of marine biodiversity is represented by the active swimmers. So again, no continuity, but an abrupt event, which actually correlates with another event that has been called explosion. It's the odontode explosion at the same time. And it refers to the sudden appearance uh, of tooth-like structures in the different groups of, of fish-like vertebrates. So that would be ray fin fish, lobe fin fish, and the shark relationship. And also in the Devonian, we have another terrestrial revolution after land plants appeared, and that is the origin of uh, four-legged land vertebrates. And here is something very strange. We have this very nice evolutionary lineage that you find in textbooks where you have this progression from fish-like forms, so-called fisherpods, which are uh, silicon-like uh, forms that are considered to be ancestors of the land-living uh, uh, quadrupedal animals. And then you have several morphologically intermediate forms and then forms that are salamander-like. But the problem is that there have been tracks discovered of tetrapods in Poland, the so-called Sarkelmi tracks. And they turned out to be about 11 million years older than the oldest, not only previously known salamander-like, animals, but even older than the oldest known fisherpods, which are the supposed ancestors of land living animals. So land living animals are 11 million years older than their supposed ancestors. Something is not really correct here, isn't it? And my own field of expertise is insect origins and the fossil record of insects. And if we look at the uh, uh, different fossils of flying insects. And we uh, find that all these different groups, the major categories of flying insects, that would be something like beetles, wasps, uh, locusts, cockroaches, mayflies, dragonflies, they all appear suddenly in the Carboniferous at the border between the lower and the upper Carboniferous about 320 million years ago. And the stunning thing is, 
not only did primitive groups appear, which would be the Darwinian expectation that we find first groups lie like locusts and cockroaches and dragonflies and mayflies, but we also find in the, the Carboniferous already holometabolous insects that, that are insects like beetles and, and wasps. And these are insects that have this miraculous mode of ontogeny, which is called metamorphosis, where you have first a larva, which looks like a caterpillar. Then you have a resting stage called pupa, where the whole body is dissolved into a kind of soup, and then rearranged into the totally different looking adult animal. And then from the pupa emerges a beetle or a butterfly. This extremely different mode of development. Other insects develop by gradual molting and the larva gets with each molting more similar to the adult. But to get this resting stage where the whole body is dissolved into a kind of soup, that is impossible to explain with Darwinian evolution anyway. But to have it at the very beginning of flying insects together with the oldest flying insects is absolutely uh, stunning and, and unexpected for uh, uh, a Darwinian biologist. And if we look in the Triassic, that would be the next age in, in Earth history uh, after the biggest mass extinction event that happened in, in Earth history, we find a real carpet bombing of different explosions. Uh, there has been a book by Peter Ward. He's an evolutionary biologist and an opponent of intelligent design. He once uh, debated uh, uh, Stephen C. Meyer. And uh, he wrote a book which has the title Out of Thin Air, which deals with this uh, Triassic uh, revolution. And Here's a quote from this book. It was important for animal life on land as the Cambrian explosion was for marine animal life. So this is not something that we Darwin critics make up. This is something that uh, evolutionists admit that we find this Cambrian explosion-like pattern over and over again. Some examples from the Triassic. Here are the, the origins of the different subgroups of tetrapodus. Uh, quadrupedal land animals. So we find the first uh, uh, dinosaurs, the first uh, turtle uh, relatives, the third crocodile relatives, the third, uh, first lizard relatives, and the first real mammal relatives. We also find in the Triassic a sudden jump from zero to 15 different families, different body plans of marine reptiles here, just a small selection of these marine reptiles. And this includes ichthyosaurs, where you have within the lifespan of a single larger vertebrate species, a transition from supposed monitor lizard-like land living ancestor to, to a completely fish-like ichthyosaur. And you also have the sudden origin of gliding and flying reptiles with different solutions for gliding and flying, including the first actively flying pterosaurs. And they appear in a 2 million year window of time. And also the most popular fossil animals at all, probably dinosaurs. There was a paper just uh, one year ago uh, about the origin of dinosaurs in the Triassic. It was published in Nature Communications. And here is a quote from this paper. It's amazing how clear cut the change from no dinosaurs to all dinosaurs was. If this wouldn't be a quote from this paper, everybody would think this is a quote from Answers in Genesis, or but it's actually a finding from evolutionary biologists. We find the same pattern of sudden appearance in these marine reptiles, the so-called mosasaurs and the Cretaceous. And then we also have in the Cretaceous the sudden appearance of flowering plants with this very complex reproductive structures of the flower. And this was already known to Charles Darwin and he called it an abominable mystery because at Darwin's time, uh, this phenomenon was used by some of his opponents to make a case for design and for, for uh, divine intervention into the history of life. And Darwin was very puzzled because this sudden appearance of flowering plants conflicted with his gradualist expectations. And again, a quote from an evolutionist paper, flowers sprang forth during the Cretaceous period as fully formed as Aphrodite. And the interesting thing is, 
if these gaps would be gaps of knowledge, you should expect that the gaps get smaller the more you find. But actually, since Darwin's time in 150 years of paleontological research, this problem of the sudden origin of flowering plants has become worse and more problematic, not less problematic, which tells us something that this is really a, a real discontinuity, a real gap in the fossil record and not just an artifact of our undersampling. We have the same pattern in butterflies. They appear suddenly in the lower tertiary. We have the same pattern in modern birds. All these different families of modern birds appear in a 10 million year window of time in the lower tertiary. And it has been called by a famous uh, uh, paleoornithologist mapping the big bang of bird evolution. And if we look at mammals, unsurprisingly, meanwhile, we find the same pattern, all the different orders and orders are the larger categories like carnivores and ungulates and primates and rodents and uh, 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 manatees and elephants and so on. Uh, all these orders are found first in the fossil record in a very narrow window of time in the lower tertiary. And there's another interesting thing. This blue tree that you hear, see here is the most modern tree of the relationship of mammal orders based on comparison of, of um, their genomes. And the horizontal axis is a time axis and the point where the branchings are are the reconstructed ages based on the so-called molecular clock method. And it's the most modern molecular clock method using so-called relaxed clocks and multiple fossil calibration points and name it. So that is as good as it can get. And if you look, the red dots are the actual fossil, oldest fossil discoveries. And you see these don't align at all with the reconstructed branching events and the reconstructed timing of the divergences of these groups. They all appear in this small yellow band of time and not in the upper Cretaceous where they should be according to the molecular clock. This is not just in mammals. That is a general pattern that we find nearly in all groups that we find this uh, conflicting evidence between molecular data and fossil data. And this also tells us something. If Darwin's theory is really correct, then all different uh, sources of data should converge to one true story, but it doesn't. And if we look at our own history, the genus Homo, then many people will think, well, we have all these different kinds of ape men, Australopithecines from, from Africa. Uh, probably we have some gradual picture of development there from chimp lying forms to our own uh, species, but actually here is a paper by one of the most famous mainstream evolutionary paleoanthropologists, so specialist for fossil humans, John Hawkes. And John Hawkes uh, wrote a paper where he compared these uh, earlier forms with the first forms of the genus Homo. And what he found is that the changes were sudden and not gradual that the earliest homo remains differ significantly from Australopithecines. And guess how it was called uh, the study? Uh, the new study suggests a big bang theory of human evolution, as it was called in Science Daily. And even if we don't look at our bodies, but at our cultural origins, uh, I have here plotted a, a diagram where you can see 50 different types of cultural activity. And this ranges from stone tool making to carvings and cave paintings and weaving and the first appearance of fire and cooking and so on. Green is activities that are just tool making and red or brown uh, are activities that uh, indicate symbolic thinking like cave paintings and carvings and jewelry and so on. And what we find is that we have a sudden burst of indication of symbolic thinking in the so-called upper paleolithic. And it, this whole event has been called the upper paleolithic human revolution. Again, a revolution and revolution is a title that you only give to events that are not gradual. If it's gradual, it's not a revolution. And uh, evolutionists have even speculated that this uh, may have been caused by a genetic mutation that rewired the brain. This picture is still valid, even 
though there have been discoveries in South uh, African caves about 70,000 years ago, those uh, findings there are on the same cultural level as Neanderthals and they didn't change the picture that the real uh, indication for symbolic thinking appears suddenly in the upper Paleolithic. And of course, uh, I, I don't have to allude too much to your fantasy to imagine what, what could have been that changed a behavior that was before not symbolic thinking to symbolic thinking. Uh, could it have something to do with uh, something that uh, Christians would call uh, being in the image of God? Just asking the question. So let's change gears uh, for a moment and look at something else. Uh, what we have looked before was macroevolution, the large transitions in the fossil record. But what about the minor transitions, the transitions between fossil species, the species to species transitions, which only require very tiny changes. What are there the evidence that this happens gradually instead of suddenly? <clears throat> you probably have heard of, uh, of the theory of punctuated equilibria that was coined by uh, Eldridge and Gould because they as paleontologists knew that most fossil evidence point to sudden appearance of new species and then it exists for a time, then it went, goes extinct and then a new species appears that looks similar but appears suddenly on the scene. There were only three textbook examples, classical textbook examples for gradual species to species transition. So what happened to these textbook examples? Let's look at the first one. It's from marine uh, protozoans with a skeleton, very beautiful uh, little organisms called foraminiferans. And uh, the example, the textbook example is the transition from Globorotalia plesiotumida to Globorotalia tumida. Well, there has been a paper in 2009 in PNAS and it is called, and the title already tells you everything, Evidence for Abrupt Speciation in a Classic Case of Gradual Evolution. So they looked again at the evidence and they had more material at their uh, available and they found that uh, it's not evidence for gradual evolution but for abrupt spe speciation. The second example was from fossil freshwater snails. And uh, these freshwater snails stem from a Miocene, a tertiary basin in Germany. And in the uh, 19th century, there was a German paleontologist called Franz Hilgendorf. And he used the uh, snail shells from this basin to create the first tree a phylogenetic tree that showed uh, uh, the change of species uh, by Darwinian evolution. So in a way, the first confirmation of Darwin's theory in terms of a tree using fossils. And you see here the original tree constructed by Hilgendorf in the 19th century with these real fossil snail shells glued on it. Now there was very early critique by contemporary other paleontologists who doubted that these shells actually represent different species. And they questioned, could they be just different morphs of the same species living in the same lake at the same time? And it's just a question of, let's say if you have a colder winter, then you get a different shell type. And, in, in, uh, a, uh, and if you have less rain in summer, you get a different shell type and so on, so-called eco-phenotypes. Now, these snails still exist. The genus Guraula still exists. And there has been a study in 2015. And they studied uh, these uh, snails in a lake on the roof of the world on the Tibetan plateau. And what they found is exactly these different shell types of the, the Hilgendorf tree living together in the same lake at the same time belonging to the same species. So this whole tree is bogus. It's not showing any kind of evolution between different species. It's just the arrangement of different shells of the same species that live contemporary in the same habitat. No evolution there. And then there was a final textbook example and this has been called as one of the strongest cases for so-called anagenesis in the fossil record. Anagenesis is the type of generation of a new species where an ancestral species gradually dissolves, morphs into a descendant species. The alternative would be 
the cladogenetic speciation where you have this branching and where the branches diverge then from a common ancestor. So the strongest case for a gradual morphing of one species into the other is from our own supposed ancestry from the species Australopithecus anamensis to Australopithecus afarensis. Afarensis is the species of the famous Lucy fossil. Now, recently, just uh, uh, 2019, there was a new discovery of a skull of Australopithecus anamensis, and the, it could be very precisely dated with radiometric dating. And the result was interesting because it showed that the two species were coexisting over several hundred thousand years, which shows it impossible that anamensis dissolved and morphed into afarensis if they lived at the same time. So this has been debunked as well. All three textbook examples for gradual species to species transitions are gone. And this is not only those examples, there is a general pattern again here. And in after the Darwin year 2009, there has been a study by Hunt 2010 published in the American Naturalist. And what he did is he looked at all the fossil evidence for species to species transformation in the light of 150 years of paleontological research after Darwin. There should be something in 150 years of, of research with millions of fossils that have been discovered since then. And what he finds, and, and I have highlighted here, read parts of, of the, the interesting quote from his paper, because you have to read a little bit between the line. He says, the meandering and fluctuating trajectories captured in the fossil record are not inconsistent with the centrality of natural selection. Of course, he has to make a bow to, to Darwin's theory as an evolutionary mechanism, but they probably would not have been predicted without the benefit of an empirical fossil record. So what he really says is here, what they found is not a directional uh, evolution in any of these examples in 150 years of research, but meandering, fluctuating trajectories, back and forth chaotic patterns. And this would not have been predicted without the fossil record because it contradicts the theory. Otherwise, it would have been predicted from the theory. So what he really says is the fossil record contradicts Darwin's theory. But of course, he wouldn't have published his paper if he would have written this into his abstract. And then there is a, and that is my final point, uh, a larger problem that originates from the fossil record. And that is something that I'm currently working on as a research project and it's a so-called waiting time problem. So I already said that the fossil record is usually considered as best evidence for Darwin's theory uh, because it uh, establishes intermediate forms and uh, long periods of time, millions of years. And on the uh, and macro evolution, the major transitions, and on the other hand, you have population genetics, and there you can observe evolution in the lab. You have origin of drug resistance in germs in a petri dish, for example, and then people say, well, we have evidence for micro evolution in the lab, and we have the evidence from the fossil record for macro evolution and for long periods of time. And if you multiply a lot of micro with these long periods of time, then you have an explanation for macro evolution. Actually, if you combine these two disciplines, the established windows of time for major transitions in the fossil record, for example, the window of time from a tetrapodal, tetra, uh, quadrupedal assumed ancestor of marine whales to the first fully marine dolphin-like whales. And you look at this window of time and then you use the methodological apparatus of population genetics. Uh, there's a real mathematical apparatus there where you can do calculations and you can put numbers into this whole thing and these numbers don't have to be speculated. We can make estimates on the population size of a larger mammal species that existed at this time. It certainly was not the population size of mosquitoes today and it was probably was not the population size of the giant panda. So it was somewhere in between. And we can estimate the generation time for a way like ancestor. It certainly was not in the minute realm like uh, bacteria, but rather several years and so on. So you could put these numbers into the formula apparatus. And what you consistently find is that the 
times that you require for the necessary genetic changes to make these kind of re-engineerings of the body plan to not only originate in the ancestral population, but also to spread in the ancestral population, which is required to make it a new feature, a new trait of this species. These waiting times, these two waiting times are orders of magnitude longer than the available windows in the fossil record. And this is a mathematical problem, basically refuting the feasibility of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. So it's not only that we Darwin critics and intelligent design proponents see these problems. Sometimes you hear from people like Dawkins, well, there is no problem, there is no debate, it's all fact and all the rest is just creationist nonsense. I participated at a conference at the uh, renowned Royal Society in London that was co-founded by, by Newton. And the conference was in 2016. It was called New Trends in Evolutionary Biology. And the keynote speaker was one of the most famous theoretical biologists who's working on the theory of evolution, Professor Gerd Müller. And in his keynote speech, he showed this slide. And I show it in large because it is really revealing. It's titled Explanatory Deficits of the MS Theory. Explanatory deficits, what the theory cannot explain. explain. MS stands for modern synthesis, which is just a synonym for neo-Darwinism. And look what he lists among the deficits, what the theory cannot explain. Phenotypic complexity, new complex organs, phenotypic novelty, new structures that arise in the history of life and non-gradual forms of transitions, what we have heard of before in my talk. If the theory cannot explain this, then what is the theory good for? Uh, nobody disputes that neo-Darwinism can explain the origin of a dozen uh, Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands from one founder finch species. But if it cannot explain how the feather arose, how birds came into being in the first place, and why they came into being so non-gradually, so abruptly in the fossil record, then there is a major problem with the theory. Most theoretical biologists who really work on this theory, 99% of the biologists don't, they work on their everyday research. And therefore the consensus is actually that they all agree with Darwin is actually quite irrelevant. Those few experts who really work on this theory, there is a growing consensus that Darwinism has failed to explain these phenomena and now they are desperately looking for a new paradigm and they discuss a lot of new ideas like niche construction and phenotypic plasticity and Evo Devo and name it. None of these phenomena have yet shown to fill these explanatory deficits of Darwin's theory. So what could explain what we find complex new information, specified new information, non-gradual appearances, abrupt appearances of new stuff. We know what can explain this. We know it from our everyday experience. What can create new information? It's a mind, the activity of a mind, the causal efficacy of a, a conscious agent, intelligent agent. So it's not only that uh, these findings show that Darwin's theory has a problem, it also shows that intelligent design is the better explanation for the evidence. So with this, I want to close my talk. If you want to know more about my work, you can uh, either visit my website. It's www.beckley.at. Or you can look for my articles at Evolution News, which is the, the uh, new site of Discovery Institute uh, called Evolution News Org. Or you can also listen to different uh, issues of the ID the Future podcast by Discovery Institute, idthefuture.com. So thanks for listening. And there, with this, I want to close and uh, we can open it up for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckley. And we have several interesting questions and I'm, I'm just gonna go through as many, read as many as I can here. And uh, the first one says, uh, could life have been on the asteroid bombardment? In other words, did life come in on the asteroids? No, 
<laughs> because you have to imagine the asteroids, uh, it has been reconstructed what was the probable diameter and the mass of these asteroids. So there's one of these asteroids had a diameter of about 500 kilometers. To compare the asteroid that has uh, led to the extinction of dinosaurs and that uh, led to the extinction of 50% of, of all animal species on our planet had about a diameter of, of 10 to 15 kilometers. So uh, if you see this size and if all oceans were evaporated with these impact events, uh, these events were a kind of sterilization of Earth. So any life that would have existed on these asteroids would have been evaporated in this heat. This incredible impact generates so much heat, so much energy, like millions and millions of nuclear uh, explosions. Uh, no life could uh, survive the impact of the meteorite itself and, and uh, no life could have survived on Earth if it existed before. Uh, those impact events. Oh, thank you. And then we have another um, comment and question uh, from someone. And this person says, although I have a degree in chemistry, I often question the dating techniques as they give the impression that the dating is flawless. Could you please comment? Yeah, of course, there are always, let's say, margins of error. But these margin of error are actually in most of these dating techniques quite well understood. So when you uh, see these datings, they are always, always given with it's 530 million years plus minus 260,000 years or something. And uh, it's not like sometimes it painted uh, as if these radiometric dating methods are all based on the assumption that you have this constant rate of, of decay and that you have to know the mother isotopes, uh, how much were there, how much daughter isotopes were there. Uh, that is not really true. If you look at the most uh, sophisticated modern meth methods for radiometric dating, and of course these methods also evolved over time, they have become much more accurate. Uh, the error margins are well understood. You don't have to know the initial amount of daughter isotopes, and you don't have to assume that the decay was constant over all of Earth history. When you see some uh, results where, especially uh, among, uh, if you look at young Earth uh, creationist sources, which say, well, we have dated these volcanic layers and uh, it was an eruption that was 50 years ago and the radiometric dating gave a result 2 million years old. This shows radiometric dating is nonsense. Uh, in all these cases, the method has simply been misapplied. So uh, uh, every, every method has to be applied in, uh, in the correct way on, uh, and, and uh, has certain error sources. And you cannot use, let's say, carbon dating on volcanic rocks, or then you get nonsense results. Or if you use it for ages older than 40,000 years, if it is carbon dating, there are other isotopes that go far back in time. But carbon dating, if you let's say date something that is million years old, you will always get an age of uh, 40,000 years because that is the kind of background noise of this method. And therefore it's not surprising that if you date dinosaur bones with carbon dating that you get a younger result that is actually really to be expected from the method because that's a background noise and you cannot exclude that. All right, thank you so much. We, we had a couple of other questions about dating, but I think that answered the, um, some of the dating questions. So I'll go on to, um, here's another comment. It says, uh, Dr. Beckley, could you please go into more uh, of the criticisms of the Cambrian explosion? I've heard a lot of zoology professors talk about the soft bodied bias in the fossil record yeah. and hold to that as an explanation that soft body animals are around perhaps 500 million years before the Cambrian explosion. Right. So uh, that is basically a subset of the so-called uh, artifact hypothesis. Uh, the claim would be these ancestors were soft-bodied and they were small and therefore they could not be preserved. That's actually not true. As I said, we have now from the Ediacaran these so-called Burgess Shale type fossils and from the Burgess Shale type localities, if they are from the Cambrian, we know that they can preserve small soft-bodied animals in 
delicate detail we have uh, from, uh, from the Shenyang locality in China. We even have fossil nervous systems where you can see the ganglia, the brains of arthropods that lived 500 million years ago. Uh, so uh, these localities definitely can preserve uh, soft bodied animals, even if they lack any kind of hard parts and, and are small. And we have now a dozen of this type localities from all over the world from the Idyakaran and there are no animals there. What we do find are these strange Idyakaran uh, uh, so-called Idyakaran biota, these alien looking forms. Uh, of course, some of them have been called potential animals. And I recently have a long article series on evolution use where I look at all these claims that some of the Idyakarans allegedly could have been animal uh, ancestors or animals and show why this is not only not true because I don't believe it or because Darwin critics don't believe it, but because if you look at the mainstream evolutionist literature, you find that there is strong, heavy evidence and also explicit statements by mainstream paleontologists and evolutionists that these are definitely not animals. Just one example is the strange symmetry uh, Idiacaran organisms like Spregina cannot be, even if they superficially look like, let's say, a trilobite or a worm, uh, they cannot be such animals because they have a so-called glide symmetry. They don't have a bilateral symmetry. And the bilateral symmetry is the core feature of bilaterian animals. That's why they call bilaterian animals. We are bilaterians. We have a left and a right side, and they have a mirror symmetry left to right. And if animals don't have this and don't have this left-right mirror symmetry, they cannot be uh, animal ancestors of the Cambrian phyla. And a lot of these an arguments exist. So I invite uh, to look at the article series at Evolution News from the past months and two years. All right, thank you. Uh, here's another um, comment. At school, we were taught that after the meteor strike, all dinosaurs were wiped out uh, and only shrew-like animals survived. And I found it hard to believe that all mammals descended from that. Could you please comment? Yeah, that, uh, the, the actual view is that with this meteorite event, about 50% of all animal life vanished, including the large dinosaurs. Uh, the, the evolutionist view today is not that dinosaurs went extinct, but that one lineage of dinosaurs, uh, a feathered uh, small group of bipedal uh, raptorial dinosaurs morphed into birds. And, and actually modern birds are nothing but a, a, a surviving subgroup of, of dinosaurs. And the, the view indeed is that mammals descended from these shrew-like small uh, mammals of the, the late Cretaceous and, and early tertiary. And there have been some recent findings of larger mammals from the, the late Cretaceous, but they have nothing to do with uh, placentalian mammals that would be mammals like us or tigers or elephants. They uh, belong to a totally different group that went extinct. And the oldest uh, uh, really placental mammals that are like modern uh, uh, mammals, they are indeed of this mouse size shrew-like form. So uh, if common ancestry is correct, and actually I do think that the evidence for common ancestry is substantial and uh, the common ancestry is the best explanation for the evidence, then indeed it looks like uh, mammals descended from such shrew-like forms. The crucial question is what bring about uh, this transformation? Was it an unguided process or uh, was, was it required that you got an infusion of information from outside of the system? And that would be the claim from intelligent design theory. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Uh, what exactly does the word kind in take two pairs of clean animals from each kind mean in the words uh, God spoke to Noah? Does it mean genus, class, order, family, or even species? Good question that you should ask to an Old Testament scholar, <laughs> not to a paleontologist. But uh, I think uh, I, I don't think it makes much sense to consider the uh, the Bible as a science textbook and to find a direct correspondence between terms in the Hebrew Old Testament to modern scientific categories like family, order, species, genus. Uh, the the expression kind uh, that is used in Hebrew leaves a lot 
of room for interpretation. So it depends on your theological views and on your interpretation of the Old Testament, how you would uh, interpret this term kind. But uh, I don't have an opinion from the scientific, biological, paleontological side, of course. So. Uh, uh, if you have a young earth view, then you would have to interpret this as more aching to the family level, uh, because young earth creationists have the problem that they have to put all these animals on the ark, and, and that's difficult with uh, hundred thousands of, of uh, vertebrates living today, so they have to derive all these families basically from one ancestor on the ark. Uh, if you have an old earth view or an intelligent design view combined with uh, a common ancestry, then you would rather interpret uh, 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 the ark story as a local flood and probably the animals on the ark, uh, only local animals from the Near East and, and uh, maybe even only uh, domesticated animals and animals that have been used for, for uh, religious purposes. So it depends on your interpretation, but that's not my field. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Um, here's another one. Uh, could Gunter please address why so many textbook examples are found to be incorrect, yet they remain in the textbooks? Yeah, uh, there is, let's say, there, there are two explanations. Let's say the less sinister explanation is that always in textbooks you have a lack of, 10 to 20 years, they are behind the up-to-date knowledge of science. So it takes always many years till new research really enters a textbook, at least on the high school level. It's a little bit faster on the university level, but uh, what you learn in biology at high school usually is pretty much outdated in terms of, of modern research. So that is the general pattern. That is true in all fields, not only in fields that are controversial or are related to worldview issues. That is even true for, for totally uncontroversial fields. Right. The little bit more uh, uh, sinister explanation, of course, is that many of these examples are so welcome and so useful. Uh, if you look at Heckel's embryo, they are so, uh, these figures are so convincing that, uh, of course, if you want to convey this message of Darwinian evolution, it's hard to let go from a debunked example. And therefore, a lot of this stuff stayed much longer in textbooks than it was uh, deserved based on the debunking of these examples. But it's a fact that it happened. All right, well, thank you. All right, we have uh, several questions and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to them as uh, many as possible here in the next few minutes. And uh, we'll probably have to conclude in probably like maybe about 10 minutes, but uh, here's an interesting one. The period of 30 to 40 uh, KYA, so I guess that would be thousand years ago, was a very active one in that we see a rapid increase in art, that would be cave painting, yes. tool use, domestication of animals. Is this another kind of explosion? Yes, uh, it, it has been called this upper paleolithic human revolution. And as I said, uh, this term revolution is not used for gradual events. So all these expressions were not made up by uh, Darwin critics, these explosion events or revolution events. That's all expressions from the mainstream scientific lit literature. And they refer to the suddenness, this abruptness of these events that show that things came into being abruptly without slow transition, slow building up small changes at a time, uh, which would be the Darwinian expectation. So definitely this change in human culture is abrupt. And personally, and that, that has nothing to do with paleontology, but uh, rather with uh, uh, theology, uh, my interpretation would be that this is related to the image of God and, and, and the real change between uh, no real humans and, and real humans. Okay. Oh, boy. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm going to go quickly here. Dr. Beckley, if evolution had, a, had actually occurred, what should paleontologists find between the Precambrian and the Cambrian explosion? It depends what you mean with evolution. If you mean with evolution just a change over time and common ancestry, then what you should expect at least is to find morphologically intermediate forms. So you should find something 
that shows a transition from, let's say, a worm-like ancestor to a trilobite. And that would mean you have to build up this exoskeleton, you have to build up the, the compound eye, you have to develop these articulated appendages and so on. And this is spread over thousands of different connecting species. So even if most of them are lost to the fossil record, you should expect to find some of those, unless it happened so quickly and so saltationally that it completely eluded the fossil record. And actually, I personally think that there were such forms and that we didn't find them because it happened so quickly. But if it happened so quickly, then it cannot have happened naturalistically because that's impossibly genetically to get such quick transitions in terms of body plan by naturalistic means and Darwinian evolution. If you should mean with evolution, Darwinian evolution, so an unguided mechanism of random mutation and natural selection, then you should expect not only intermediate forms, but a lot of them and spread out over long periods of time. And then you would need for a transition from a worm to a trilobite, uh, probably hundreds of millions of years with hundreds of different uh, fossils that show this uh, connection and there's nothing like that existing. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so here's another one. Uh, it's a comment and a question. If I remember right, I read from a Campbell biology book that speciation events can occur from 40,000 to millions of years ago. I think I have that number right, yes? Which uh, seems all to also mean that species longevity can be less, as less as, or as little as uh, 40,000 years. What do you say to this? Are there any updates on the study of species longevity? Thank you and God bless you on your work, Dr. Beckley. Yeah, thank you. So the dates that I have given for species longevity are actually the most modern ones that exist of the, the best study that we, we have currently available on species longevity in the different groups. It depends on, on which group you look at. Uh, so vertebrates have a little uh, smaller species longevity than marine invertebrates. Uh, but generally, of course, this is an average value. So you can have much shorter species longevity, for example, if a species came into existence and then shortly after you have an extinction event, uh, <clears throat> either naturally or uh, human induced, induced like uh, uh, after the last ice age, a lot of the larger mammal species that, that came into existence with the ice age went extinct because they were simply hunted to extinction by, by uh, ancient humans. Uh, so you can have much shorter species longevity, of course, but the average under natural conditions is, uh, are the values that uh, I have given. And uh, uh, yeah, okay. we, we don't know in every particular case, of course, uh, was in this case, the species longevity 10 million years or 5 million years, but it is sufficient to know, let's say the range to make this case that uh, these windows of times were much too short to allow for a lot of successive species to accumulate these changes to build up these body plants, even if the speciation events do not have to be really one after the other. Of course, a species can branch while the mother species still exists and then another could branch off, but it gives you at least an idea about the shortage of the available time compared to the existence of the species. And if I may, make one final point. If you look at some modern species and molecular clock datings, for example, some bird species, which almost look indistinguishable for, for the layman. For example, in Europe, the, the fetus and the tilt top are two finches, uh, uh, not finches, uh, 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 singing birds, green. They look identical. According to molecular clocks, they have separated about three to four million years ago. There is hardly any change, even though they diverged from a common ancestor, and and uh, they should so they should have doubled the differences than just an ancestor to the descendant, and they look almost indistinguishable, even though there were four million years available. This shows that it's absolutely ludicrous to expect that you could in four million years transform a lizard into an ichthyosaur or a pig-like ancestor into a whale. That's ir irrational. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Beckley. So we have, um, gosh, we have, uh, I think about 35 more questions and we don't have that much time. So I'm just gonna ask you a few here. I'm gonna try and kind of summarize in the next few minutes. Uh, okay, so one is uh, if the theory of evolution given by Darwin has these limitation, what conclusion can be created um, to the human creation? Uh, if you could please give a short explanation, sir. Yeah. So again, what I tell you now is my personal view. I think that the fossil evidence is best explained that indeed common ancestry is correct. And I personally have no problem to be descended from an ape-like ancestor. I don't care. For me, it doesn't make a big difference if I'm descended from a lump of dirt that was animated or if God used an ancestral ape to transform it into a human. So uh, the question is, does the fossil record support Darwin's theory in the human case? And as I have shown and with this example of the Big Bang theory of, of the genus Homo is that again, we have there an abrupt transition, not a, continued, a continuity between these ape-like forms and the real genus Homo. Uh, so it really looks like there were, were uh, these events of infusion of information into the system from outside that cannot be explained with Darwin's theory, but require intelligent design also and especially in the case of human evolution. And there have also been studies using this waiting time problem, for example, by Sanford et al, uh, showing that uh, uh, the time in human, uh, there are 6 million years available according standard a uh, 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 view between the separation of the chimp lineage from the human lineage and the mainstream evolutionist calculated that a single coordinated mutation would have taken 250 million years in, in a ancient human population. So it's impossible. Okay, thank you. Now we have a few questions here. I'm gonna kind of combine these and these have to do with um, examples of uh, what some people are, are quoting as soft tissues that have been discovered in dinosaur yes. fossils. Could you address that, please? Yes, uh, that is probably the, the best evidence that has been presented in favor of this young earth case that we found in dinosaurs uh, where bones have been dissolved with acid, still flexible tissue or even uh, blood cells and, and, and uh, blood vessels uh, preserved which was totally unexpected uh, before these uh, results were confirmed. It was believed that it must be an artifact or, or an error. It cannot be that this is preserved for millions of years. Actually, we don't really know how this could be preserved over, over such long periods of time. There have been some attempts to explain this. One is that most of these structures are based on, on uh, collagen, which is a, of all the proteins, the, the most durable. Uh, that there is some process of, of uh, polymerization involved, which would be a kind of transformation of these proteins into a kind of plastic. And uh, there are uh, uh, explanations using uh, iron irons to explain how these structures could have been preserved over this long periods of time. None of these is really completely satisfying. But if I look at all the available evidence and uh, then uh, the case is clearly favoring the old earth uh, arguments and, and uh, then you have to weigh what is the best explanation for all the evidence and not just one piece of evidence. But this isolated piece of evidence is probably the best uh, evidence for, for, for young earth creation. Okay, thank you. Oh my goodness, there are so many great Great questions here, and, and, and we don't have time for all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go to one here. Um, Dr. Beckley, do you agree that an ID-based model of the history of life could be compatible with any given pattern, thus unfalsifiable, while Darwinism is way more easily potentially falsifiable? Not really. First, it's good to know that Darwinism is falsifiable because it makes certain predictions and then we can compare does the empirical evidence confirm the predictions or not. The problem is that in practice it turned out that Darwinism is not falsifiable because uh, what uh, happens in, in, in Darwin's uh, Darwin, more modern Darwinist theory is that always when you have conflicting evidence coming in the theory is adapted and is, 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 is used to evade the conflicting evidence. And, and you find this, for example, in, uh, uh, with this phenomenon of 
uh, uh, natural selection, which is like a magical wand. If you have living fossils that didn't change over hundreds of billions of years, what is the reason? Natural selection, it was stabilizing it. it uh, the, there were stable conditions and therefore the animals stayed the same. If they change very rapidly, oh, it was natural selection because the condition changed and then it can be very transformative in short periods of time. It's a little bit like the old weather saying, uh, uh, if the cockerel crows on his favorite spot, the weather may change or again, it may not. These kind of explanation can explain everything and nothing. So if we look really in detail, Darwinism is not falsifiable because of this property. If we look at intelligent design theory, intelligent design theory also make very clear predictions. In the fossil record, it is true, intelligent design is the best explanation for these discontinuities. But of course, intelligent design would also be compatible with a continuous fossil record. But there, it would no longer be the best explanation. Therefore, there it would, uh, let's say, uh, be in competition with Darwin's theory. And then it would depend what is the best explanation for all the evidence. But if we look at other areas like molecular evidence, then we find uh, intelligent design theory predicts based on William Dembski's work that we will not be able to generate more than 500 bits of information in our universe given the available probabilistic resources with unguided processes. You just have to invent a single computer program to do this and intelligent design theory is refuted. So it is refutable, maybe not with fossils, but with other stuff very easily. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go with one last question. There's uh, still many questions. And so what we'll do is we will take these questions that are in the chat and we will submit them to you, uh, Dr. Beckley, because sure. we would like to uh, see if we could, uh, you know, have you answer these. And maybe uh, we, we don't know if we'll have them posted on our particular website, but possibly we will. Uh, how do animals transform into different species in your view from normal reproduction and suddenly there is a sudden transformation between mother and son or a completely different process like separate creation or is all of this possible? Yeah, definitely all is possible. The question is what does the evidence point to? And uh, I think if you look at minor variations as the example of the Darwin finches. I think this is possible by naturalistic means like, like uh, Darwinian evolution to get 10 or 12 uh, finch species from a single finch species based on natural selection and random variation. But uh, if we look at the larger transitions, I think that these transitions came about uh, by a combination of common ancestry and intelligent design, and that it is very similar to an old view uh, of uh, saltational history of life, where you have this kind of uh, what Goldschmidt called hopeful monsters, where uh, you have sudden changes in very few generations and uh, where uh, you basically have a kind of genetic engineering in the womb of the, the mother and then giving birth to a, a already uh, different organism. So that would be my view, saltational evolution by intelligent design. Okay, uh, very interesting. So, um, so we're really kind of out of time here, folks. And so I want to thank everyone for participating. Dr. Beckley, I have copied all the questions. I'm going to paste them in a document. I'm going to send it to you. And then I would like to um, ask everyone if you would be so kind as to check out our website. Um, Dr. Johansson earlier uh, shared some information about that. And uh, certainly, Dr. Beckley shared some information about that. So if you go to discovery.org, discovery.org, you can subscribe to be on Evolution News and Views. You can be on ID the Future podcasts. And then if you go to um, the website, you can also, uh, if you go to our website, we hope to post this video. And I'm, I can't speak exactly for the Science and Culture Network in Colorado, but I would guess that they uh, might be uh, amenable to posting this video also. And so um, thank you everyone. We hope that you will pass along the word. Um, Jim Johansson has posted the uh, website that you can go to for everyone. It's socal.scienceandculture.network. And the other one for Colorado is Colorado dot science and culture dot network. 
And so in any case, uh, we just thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. It's, it's really been a privilege to talk to people around the world. And I know that um, I certainly was blown away by the fact that land mammals uh, predated the fish. You know, uh, that's a takeaway for me that was uh, really amazing. I mean, the, out of many wonderful takeaways. So Dr. Beckley, we really thank you and thank you. Uh, wish you all the best and we'll uh, all be in touch. So thank you everyone. And have a nice evening, Dr. Beckley. So thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, and everyone uh, have a nice rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you again at the next event. Thank you very much. Should I stay here or should we? Uh, I, I think that we're done, but uh, yes. Okay. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Uh, Ahmed said, Ahmed, uh, thank you for the recording. Can we get the recording? And uh, we're going to try and get that posted on our um, Science and Culture Network Southern California website and maybe the Science and Culture Network in Colorado also. So uh, right. stay tuned. And thank you, everyone. And that's it. So thank you so much. Cool. And uh, we will see everyone for the next one. And thank you. So thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.